to you, my brothers and sisters. What a great day to be in the land of the living. We recognize and uh, give glory to God who has extended to all of us additional time by his grace and his mercy. His mercy and grace we don't take for granted because it is God's favor. We greet you in the name of uh, the redeeming Savior, Jesus the Christ, and certainly our God, the creator of all the universe. Uh, once again, we're so privileged to be before you in this hour and in this time. 
Uh, many of our countries, I should say in particular this country, many of us are experiencing excruciating time, difficult time, times that have never been seen or embarked upon before. But I am a believer of the word of God. And the word of God tells us about times as such as it is now. There were many prophets in the Old Testament, and in particular, the prophet Daniel, who spoke and prophesied about things that were to come. He spoke about the end times. Um, and then there was, of course, Jesus, who spoke on the Mount of Olives, taught his disciples, which is called also the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And from these passages of scriptures, the uh, seven prophetic things that must happen before the return of Jesus, we were... Um, catapulted, uh, for lack of a better word, we were pushed into the book of Revelation. It is impossible to talk about the prophet Daniel and the Olivet Discourse, the teachings of Jesus to his disciple, without getting into the book of Revelation. Now, we understand that the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy, it's about things that are to come. And certainly, um, we will begin to, um, we'll begin to get into the book of Revelation, Revelation, the fifth chapter. Now, as I previously spoke, that this chapter in particular is basically the prophet or the prophecy from Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament. So what we are now rehearsing in this hour is the prophecy which Daniel spoke about uh, in chapter 12, verse 4. And from that particular prophecy, came what is known now as the seven-sealed book, uh, which is to be open in this book of Revelation. But the prophecy of Daniel, which was recorded in the Old Testament, Daniel, the 12th chapter, the fourth verse, that prophecy read, but thou... O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now listen to this. Many shall run to and fro, and, and knowledge shall be increased. Let me read that prophecy again. This was the prophecy that Daniel gave but was instructed by God to seal until future times. And the, the future times is now the time that we are now living in. The prophecy, once again, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 reads, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Listen, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And this prophecy was to be sealed up. Daniel was instructed to seal this prophecy up. This prophecy was to be sealed up, not understood, to 
or until the end of the age. So Daniel was instructed not to reveal the understanding nor to give interpretation of this particular, this particular prophecy. Seal it up. And at some point in time, at the end of the age, this prophecy would be open and interpreted. This was a book in which he wrote the vision and prophecies delivered to him by God. And Daniel was bid, rather told, to shut up, to keep this prophecy from the common and profane people who would only make mockery, meaning that the prophecy would become comical, comically exaggerated. So Daniel was told to keep it to himself, which would be a particular or somewhat a secret treasure that was endorsed or committed to his care. And though it was not kept from the saints, the people of God, from reading it, yet Daniel was instructed not to interpret nor to explain this prophecy to anyone. It was to remain a secret until the time when all the vision, the prophecy was near at hand, meaning that, that it was to be held secret, sealed up, held secret until such a time as now. So this denotes the obscurity of the prophecy, the difficulty in understanding it, being like a book that's shut up and sealed until the appointed time. Uh, this is now the time, the hour, the moment, and the day now that this prophecy is to be unraveled, that it is to begin uh, to be manifested. The time has come to pass. Now, uh, this leads us, this particular prophecy leads us into the book of Revelation. And this prophecy picks up in Revelation, the fifth chapter, verses one through five. The seven seals contain secret documents or rather information only God knew until the lamb or the lion was found worthy to open the book or the scroll. It was only then that the lamb or the lion could look at the contents and become knowledgeable of the contained information. The seven seals of God are the seven symbolic seals that secured the book or rather scroll that John visions take place on the island of Patmos. This is the vision that John saw in an, uh, in an un, uh, apocalyptic vision. Now, the opening of the seals of the document happens here in Revelation, chapter 5 through 8. But it marks the seven or the second coming of Christ Jesus and the beginning of the apocalypse. In John's vision, the only one worthy to open the book or this scroll is referred to as both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb. That particular Lamb would have seven horns and seven eyes. And as we begin to matriculate in 
the verses of chapter 5 here in the book of Revelation. It begins with, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Verse 2 reads as such, And I saw a strong angel. This is John revealing what he is seeing in this vision. Verse 2, he says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? So this angel, standing tall, No doubt, making sure that he is heard. He shouts out and he proclaims, Who is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof? Now, I look at that possibly as a twofold meaning. Because when you ask who is worthy, first thing, you might not know anybody among you that is worthy spiritually to open this book. In my own interpretation, one who is worthy has to be a clean, pure, righteous one. He has to have clean hands. Verse 3, once again, John, the revelator, John the theologian talking, John, the elder at the church of Ephesus. Verse 3, and no man in heaven nor in earth. In other words, nobody is clean enough, nobody is qualified. There is not one worthy and no man in heaven nor earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Nobody. There was not one. This is what John is saying. No one is worthy. But then in verse 4, he began to to, to, to talk, and he says, and I wept much, meaning he cried quite a bit. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So the mystery of the contents that was in this sealed book had been a mystery for many of years since the prophet Daniel had spoke, prophetically spoken. But now here in the book of Revelation, in particular the fifth chapter through the eighth chapter, there comes a cry from John on the island of Patmos from his vision in the vision that he had, he saw this angel proclaiming who is worthy. So John began to weep because in his mind, no doubt, there was no one that was worthy to open this seven-sealed book. But now in verse 5, it reads, and one of the elders said unto me, and this is an elder telling John to stop crying, stop weeping. One of the elders says unto John, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Listen here. The lion of the tribe of Judah. 
the root of David, had prevailed to open the book. Now, that's a key verse. And to loose the seven seals. Let me read that again. Because there is your answer of who is worthy to open the seven sealed book. Verse 5 says again, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now listen to this. That's the description of the magnificent one. That is the description of our Redeemer. That is the description of the only one who has stood the test of times, the only one who has been crucified. This is the, the description of Jesus, our Savior. Now look at this. Second part of that, he says, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book. Now, the word prevail means that he had gone through, he has come through, he has experienced things that no other man could experience and live, die and live, come back to life. Jesus had an experience that no other man could walk in. Jesus knew no sin, so he was the perfect sacrificial lamb, the only one that had clean hands that was destined and could reveal the secret documents or the secrets within this seven-sealed book. So in the second part of verse 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Jesus is from the root of David. Had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throng... And of the four beasts, now this is going back preceding to, to chapter 4, when it talks about the uh, 24 elders, when it talks about the, 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 the 24 elders sitting on the throne, on their thrones, there and the beast worshiping God, beast crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So this is the description in verse 6. Of them, and he says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now, in the Old Testament, In the Old Testament teachings, when there had to be atonement of any kind, they would choose a young lamb. They would choose a young lamb to make the, sac uh, the sacrifice for atonement. But that no longer has to be because in the New Testament, was born unto us a savior. <laughs> Not only did he know no sin, but he became our redeeming savior. So it speaks here about the lamb having to be perfect, the lamb having to have no blemish. But here it speaks and it says, there stood in the midst of the elders, the 24 elders, a lamb. 
as it had been slain, having seven horns. Now pay attention. This lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This lamb having seven horns and seven eyes, which represents the seven spirits of God, which was sent forth into all the earth or into the earth realm, the domains of the earth. Verse 7, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. My question is, do you feel like any of us or anybody else could be worthy to get that close to him that sits on the throne? Him that sits on the throne is the image, as we previously spoke of in chapter 4. It is the image of God sitting on the throne with a rainbow going all around. The stone of Jasper, the sardine stone. This is the image of him that sits upon the throne. So do you think any of us would be worthy? No, it had to be somebody with clean hands, somebody that was unblemished. It had to be someone that stood the test of time, that came to redeem all mankind, sent back into the earth, to redeem all of us. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now from verse 8 on, it begins to talk about the worship. The living creatures and the elders begin to worship God. And Jesus, because of his redemption. Verse 8 reads as such, and when he had taken the book, listen, the four beasts and four and twenty elders, the twenty-four elders, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. Having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors. That's pleasant perfumes. They fell down to worship the king. They fell down to worship the lamb the Lamb of God. And they brought incense, orders, which in our time is perfumes, colognes, great smelling stuff. They brought these things to worship. The beast and four and 20 elders fell down, verse 8, before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, listen at this, and golden vows full of orders, which are, listen at this, golden vows full of orders. That gives us the example here. The golden vows full of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. Wow. Isn't that often Oh, isn't that awesome to be accounted as a sweet-smelling savor, orders unto our God, the prayers of the saints? Verse 9, and they sung a new song saying, listen, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain, now here it goes, and has redeemed us to God. It's talking about Jesus. Who else was slain? 
died on a cross at Calvary, buried in a borrowed tomb, then came back to life, resurrected. So they sung a new song, worshiping him, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us, redeemed man, us, to God. By thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, we shall reign on earth. People of God, we are kings. We are priests. We're special in the sight of God. He does not want us to suffer or to be in hardship. Yes, suffering, persecution come against those that worship the Lord eventually if it haven't already. But God wants us to have his best. He wants us to enjoy this life. But because of sin, which has become a contradiction to our priesthood and kings, Sin has brought about and is bringing about tribulation. Verse 11, the angels, this is where the angels exalt the lamb. Verse 11, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels, angels round about the throne. And the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. The angels were around about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Then in verse 13 and 14, it climaxes this particular chapter with uh, a universal adoration of the Lamb who is king. Listen, verse 13 reads as such, and every creature which is in heaven, listen, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, creatures, and all that are in them, heard I sin. Blessings and honor, and glory and power, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. And unto the Lamb forever and ever. My God, what a powerful salute. That is so powerful. I wonder what it would be like if we began to worship the Lord our God and our redeeming Savior. What it would be like if we would take the same approach. If we would take the same approach as these 24 elders Elders, as these angels and these beasts, everything that we see here 
that we've seen with our own eyes was created for the worship of God. And if the beasts can worship God, the 24 elders which are seated, are seated around the throne, the angels, as they multiply thousands and thousands upon a thousand, all of these angels, every living creature, every living thing, including us, that takes the authority to do otherwise than to worship the Lord, our God. Every living thing was created for that. We are the only beings, man, that God didn't take away the power of choice. The scripture says, know ye not that this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, so we belong to God. Some may say, well, why didn't God make us to worship, make us, force us to worship him and Jesus as these beasts, the angels and the elders? Why didn't God force us? The reason for that is that God never took the power of choice away from man. Meaning that we have the power to do as we pick and we choose. But there comes a time and a day that all of us will have a reckoning day. The word tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. There will come a time that you wished that you should have given your all to God. There will come a time that you will beg to those that didn't yield or give to God. There will come a time that you will beg, God, give me one more chance. But it will be too late. Because you chose to do differently. The day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. When you hear the hand of Jesus knocking upon your heart, knocking at the door, you must open the door and receive him. And this is what we must do to have the privilege, to have the enjoyment, to have the pleasure, to have the, ben the benefits of being with God in eternity. Verse 14 in my climax, and the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders listened, fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Listen, my brothers and sisters, a lot of us think that we have time. A lot, a lot think that we have more time. But let me, let me bring this to your mindset. God is time. He is eternal. He is the creator of time. He set the time from the beginning. Before you were born and before you knew of time, he set time. And he will end time, but time cannot end because time is God. God is eternal. So I said to you today that have the opportunity and have the privilege, this is the hour. And if I were you, I would submit myself. I would submit myself completely to Jesus, our redeeming Savior. No man knoweth the hour nor the time that the Son of Man shall make his appearance. And while the blood is running warm in your brain. Why, why you have 
chance while the blood is yet running warm in your veins, your body. I would give my life, my whole being to Jesus that I may will, that I may live with God in eternity. Well, you might say, how do you do that? Very simple. The first step in the process is to denounce the, the hidden things of darkness. Second thing is to repent of all of your sins, all evil doings, all calamity, every trespassing thing that you've done, that you know you have done, and you ask God to forgive you. And if you will confess these things with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and God has raised him from the dead, my brothers and sisters, you are privileged. You are favored. You are saved. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I want to challenge every one of you all that don't know God. Get to a place where you can worship God. Find someone that knows Jesus in the pardon of their sins. Ask them to lead you, take you to a place of worship. If, if, if you can't get to the place of worship in these times that we are experiencing now, then have them to pray the sinner's prayer. And that is the confession of Jesus Christ. And the denunciation of Satan and all the sinful acts that come with him. Now is the time. You cannot wait any longer. For no man knows the return of the Son of God. The Son of Man. No man knows the hour. So while you have chance, give your life to Jesus. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Certainly, it has been a pleasure to be before you this hour and this time. We pray for all of you, wherever you may be. We praying for you. We praying that God will continue His blessings upon your life. I'm praying for healing for those that are incapacitated and suffering with the COVID virus. Uh, Donnell Skeeter Davis, just know that I am praying for you, my brother. All of my friends and everybody that are experiencing hardship. Just know I'm praying for you. You be blessed until the next time. God be with you until we meet again.